G'day expats, welcome to another episode of Expat Chat. I'm joined with my friend, colleague, uh, business partner, uh, Brett Evans. He is the Managing Director for the Europe, Middle East and Africa's region of Atlas Wealth. How are you going, Brett? Mate, uh, all well here, thanks, all well. And to the folks out there to introduce the uh, the gentleman who's talking, his name is Jeremy, James, Jeremy, James Ridley. And uh, uh, you'd think I'd know your name, wouldn't I now, wouldn't you? Uh, James Ridley, <laughs> he's the Managing Director for the Asia and the Americas region. G'day, James. G'day, mate. Listen, I, I feel like I might be better looking than Jeremy, um, so <laughs> I'll go back and have a chat to Jeremy about that. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think we, could, we could actually put a poll up there to the listeners and see what they think. <laughs> yeah, comment for Jeremy, like talks. for James. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's right. We'll How's things how uh, in Osmo? Mate, they're good. I, I think, um, you know, we can see an end in sight and I think I, I'll probably say it too often, but uh, we're getting there now. Vaccination rates are going up. Borders are coming down. Flexibility. Um, I think as of today, uh, international um, borders have slowly come down in those states. I think Scott Morrison, you know, uh, expats that want to return can come back to those southern states except for Queensland. And then also Australians that want to head overseas, I think. Their no main sort of advice course. was, yeah, that's right. Get on Smart Traveler, you know, review the advice around, um, you know, where you're traveling, make sure you download your international border certificate uh, for your vaccination and off we go. So the fact that we're at that stage means, you know, it's only a matter of months before ideally we're almost returning back to normal, but now just living with COVID as normal. Yep, the new normal. Yeah, new normal, exactly right. I think booster shots are now due, uh, which obviously mainly for immunocompromise, but and then I think the main thing that we've seen um, probably in recent, even days, and it was, it was really strange over the weekend, the amount of media publications, which were just talking about inflation and interest rates. Uh, I don't know whether um, all the media publicators have just come out and just said, yeah, interest rates are going on the increase early next year. But it just seems like in the last four days, most of the majors, they're all talking about interest rates on the rise early next year. Yeah, well, for the November RBA meeting, you know, it, the, the chance of the RBA changing their stance, e.g. not raising rates until 2024, is yeah. pretty much going. You know, because what they've yeah. been trying to do is they've been trying to keep the April 24 um, bond yield at 0.1%. The yeah, way they right. do that is they sell in to drive the price down. Um, now what's – sorry, buy-in, the other way around um, – but now what's happened is the bond yield, the 24, uh, April 24 bond yield has now increased to 0.78%, which shows mm. that the RBA is not trying to defend that position. So there's a very good chance in the month of November that the RBA is going to relax their stance on keeping rates low. They yeah. can't. You know, you've got New Zealand raising rates. You've got a lot of the other states raising rates. You've got wage inflation right. data. You've got all these, you know, um, uh, data sets on the increase. They're going to have to do something. You know, because otherwise yeah. they're going to have a world of hurt. Big question is going to be property. You know, yeah, uh, that's right. ha how many people out there uh, who have been used to paying 2.5% of their mortgage are going to be used to paying, you know, 4% in the next 12 to 18 months? Well, that's right. Interest rates increase. It does cause a bit of a reshuffle on select asset classes, property being the major one where the values that we've been seeing or the capital growth that we're seeing is going to slow down. And it could also mean that people with high LVRs, loan to value ratios uh, that now have an interest rate of say 2.5% to 3% or 3.2%, uh, have they sort of factored that into their own cash flows or have they gone out and leveraged themselves through the teeth for property investment and now going, oh crap, I might need to sell one of these properties Can I? because my rental yields aren't enough plus whatever my savings is per month to cover that yep. mortgage payment and I'm hemorrhaging cash. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see, but yeah, you're right. I think, yeah, interest rates will go up um, next year at some point. Um, I think I've read an article that the RBA actually needs to recapitalise in order to uh, increase interest rates as well or cut the cash rate. Yep. Um, so that's probably going to be happening, I would, I would say, probably in the next three months as we lead into the new calendar year. Uh, but, yeah, definitely wouldn't want to be the uh, governor of the RBA trying to make this decision um, and keep inflation uh, at bay as well. Yeah, uh, look, I think the the inflation one's the one they got the waves with. That's the big thing. You know, they've really got to make sure that they've got a handle on it all. And if they don't have a handle on it, to me, the the big question mark is always going to be around: How do you not stifle the economy but tap the brakes in a in a measured way? 
That's right. Yeah, we don't want that shoot through effect happening that like it did back in the 90s, early 2000s, interest rates, you know, seven, eight, nine percent. Yeah. Um, I couldn't imagine what that would do to the property market, especially in those big CBDs. Good Lord. Be decimated. I mean, there's a whole generation out there who's never had a mortgage rate greater than three and a half, four percent. So, yeah. and they don't realize that when their mortgage rate goes from two and a half to four, it doesn't mean their repayments have increased by sort of 10, 20 percent. You know, there'll be a dramatic difference in, in their repayments, yeah. especially for those who are interest only. So, which yeah. I think a lot of folks are. It's going to be one of those key situations to me looking forward. Um, the data doesn't lie. And, um, you know, it's certainly going to be interesting to see what the data shows in the next couple of months. Yeah, I agree. And I think everyone's racing now to lock in these fixed rates. I think sort of when we come to the end of December, trying to pull out some of the data from the RBA or I suppose APRA and ABS, I should say, just about how many loans have been written in the last sort of three months, knowing that interest rates are going to increase. It's been interesting to see whether it's gone up or whether it's decreased. I think they reported for October and September. It was a bit of a record month, to be honest, yep. when it came to new loans. So it really seems to see if that's going to start slowing down because most of the market is now pricing in interest rates increase and therefore the property market might slow down and some areas might see a bit of a, a capital loss um, briefly. Uh, we'll have to just yeah wait, see how it plays out. But Brett, before we go on, jingle. I think it's time for a quick little dis disclaimer. Jingle, yep. 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 All the information that you have uh, consumed in today's video or podcast, you should apply the same amount of attention as to something you read on the back of a cornflakes packet. Do not take this as personal advice. Treat it as back of a cornflakes packet. And then if you need to get personal advice, speak to a professional like um, James and myself. Easy. Sounds good, mate. Well, let's kick in. Today, I want to talk about a very important topic. It comes up quite often with a lot of clients, um, even just new inquiries as well. I know you've been getting smashed with it uh, lately, mainly probably due to your fact you're in the Middle East and things work a little bit differently over there. But uh inheritance inheritance tax and just inheritance in general to be honest you've got the largest transfer of wealth ever between different demographics at the moment with baby boomers passing on their uh inheritance to gen x gen y gen z gen whatever else the other ones are um and it is you know a topic that is monopolizing conversations right now because a lot of people are going through this what do i do you know what my mum or dad or dad died um, how do I manage, you know, what's been passed through to me? Because I think there's three key considerations that you need to take. First one is obviously tax implications. Second one is emotional, yep. you know, the emotional tie to that, to that asset. Um, and last of all, you don't know what you don't know. And mm. inheritance is a very complicated issue. And you, you may think, oh, tax is fine and person I want to keep it, but you don't understand the other bits and pieces. And hopefully in today's... Yeah. Today's episode, we'll go through and sort of identify some of the key issues that people need to be aware of um, just to help them make this decisions. You and I can provide a spreadsheet that tells them what they should do, mm. but the personal side may conflict with that, but at least they know. Yeah. Um, and that's the big thing. You know, sometimes with property, you know, they don't want to sell the house because there's been three generations well, and all that sort of stuff as well. That's right. The emotional attachment to some assets uh, it, it can cause obviously a bit of a flow on effects and, you know, you, sometimes you accidentally kick the can down the curb but or kick down the road, but by doing so and holding a select asset for, you know, an additional year or two, you then hit with a big CGT bill because you're selling it whilst you're still a non-resident. And, and taking a step further, different asset classes are treated very differently from an inheritance point of view if we are a non-resident beneficiary at the time that um, you know, our mum or, or dad passes away. Um, so it's also a case where not, uh, it's very rare that you find people factor in that one of their beneficiaries as part of their will is a non-resident. It's yep. never usually laid and, and goes to that extra extent. And obviously factoring in a testamentary trust and maybe giving the executive some uh, special powers around or uh, how assets should be sold accordingly. But those are the main issues that we always see, you know, depending on the asset classes that are held within the inheritance, how they should be treated per the beneficiaries. 100%. And then the thing that doesn't help the situation in the background is the tax changes that are affecting and interrelate with the inheritance side as well. They're changing as well too. So what was done 10 years ago is not done now. What was done five years ago is not done now. And then you've also got the complicating factor too of, you know, when you do consider um, the ramifications of an inheritance um 
you know, people often get what we call analysis paralysis and they go, oh, look, I'm just going to sit on it for a couple of years and then I'll work it out. Unfortunately, yeah. and I met someone the other day, you know, a week past the two-year window for a property. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not a good situation to be, but let's run through some of those key considerations and, and really put some meat on the bones when it comes to people's understanding of what they have to deal with on the inheritance yeah. side. So as far as, you know, inheritance tax, does Australia charge inheritance tax? I mean, we're quite lucky, to be honest, compared to other countries. We we don't really have a set inheritance tax. It's mainly when it comes down to specific CGT events happening on those assets. When there's a transfer of wealth from uh, a late parent uh, that passes to the kids, depending on the assets, there's not usually a case where you're taxed on receiving that inheritance. It's what you do after to those assets is when it accounts. And then you usually sometimes lucky to inherit the original cost basis or at the time of death uh, it's a bit of a morbid topic but time of death that's when you're inheriting a new cost base depending on the asset yep. class as well so as a whole we don't technically have an inheritance tax it's what you do after um, but i guess we are lucky compared to other countries you know uk they have a pretty severe uk uh, inheritance tax if you're considered a, a domic or domicile there yep. um, us US can definitely, absolutely, but usually has to be from a, receiving an inheritance from a US citizen and you need to be connected to the US as a US tax resident. Um, Japan, Japan has some pretty loose Bad ones. inheritance. That one, that's the one that's, that's clingy to you. You can leave Japan, yeah. it still, still follows you. That's right, yeah. So um, Australia as a whole, we, we're quite lucky, but um, because we are quite lucky, it might mean that things might change for us in the future, to be honest. Um, uh, especially with uh, Labor, Liberals talking about uh, CGT discount and perhaps removing that in the future. They're now yep. getting on the bandwagon, which is a bit of a concern, franking credits, all those sort of things. So we are quite lucky. We don't actually have a technical inheritance tax. But then when you layer the fact that a non-resident beneficiary is technically treated as a tax favourable vehicle in some asset classes that you might receive, then that can trigger uh, some sort of tax event. Um, yep. So if we go through the different sort of assets uh, or asset classes, you know, let's talk about probably one of the easier ones, property. Yep. Um, property first, you know, let, there's two types of property under property as an investment. There's a main residence or a former main residence, and then there's just a flat out investment property, whether it's commercial or just a residential that's being rented out, treated very differently. Um, but the main residence, now firstly, the main residence exemption that was obviously abolished uh, last year, um, for expats, 30th of June, if you sold property after that, you're going to be hit with CGT. Uh, it still baffles me, actually, that some expats aren't aware of this change. I had an inquiry yeah. just the other day saying, I'm thinking about selling my former main residence. I've been overseas for four years. Uh, where's the property? Sydney. And you're just going, you're just shaking your head going, how, yeah. how do you not know about the change? Uh, yeah. you know, sell your wife, sell your kids, but do not sell your property. <laughs> uh, it was it was shocking, uh, but it, it just means, you know, expats are still just not educated enough, even from their own accountants. But yep. uh, if we talk about the main residence, so the main residence exemption, yep, that's been abolished, but there is this still a two-year relief window. That's right. So I think that's the, that's the one that a lot of people aren't aware of. You know, uh, they're dealing with, you know, the bereavement of someone close to them and making financial decisions is too much for uh, that particular point in time that's right which is yeah. why they give you the two-year window so to the to the watchers and the listeners out there the way it works is if someone were to, to bestow on you a property from that date for the next two years you virtually have two years to get your house in order and by that that's we right. mean if you want to access uh, whoever's bestowing that property on you the main residence exemption that they've accumulated up until that point so obviously as a principal place of residence, they don't accumulate a capital gains tax. And that can be passed on to both residents and non-residents. And people don't realise that. As long as mm -hmm. that two-year window, you've decided what you want to do from that point. So do you want to run through, James, what happens if they are to sell that property at two years in one day? Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, if they sell the property after two years in one day, you you obviously you know especially right now if you if that happened to you there's going to be a, a probably a record period of capital growth in the last two years on that property uh you know and you are up for capital gains tax um you know you're paying tax at your 
32.5%, 37 or 45% mark because uh, you're a non-resident and you're unable to pay the discount concession for that period either. Um, so 100% of that capital gain is assessable. The, the tricky part for an account is pro rata because you will still get the benefit and are entitled to the uh, partial main residence exemption for the previous owner if they lived in it. But the issue here is if you're obviously holding the property and uh, as I said, the two year period, that's obviously the stage where the government's given you a period to grieve and make those hard decisions. A lot of people blow right through that and yep. you know they'll, they'll choose to rent out the property. They'll get to five or six year mark and go, okay, we might sell it now. If they're in a good air, it's a good property. They might have accumulated thirty to forty grand in capital gains um, over the over the years each year, and then they're paying a hundred percent tax on that because they can't obviously discount it. So paying your non-resident tax rates on that, and then furthermore, yep, you'll get the benefit of a partial main residence exemption, but then that's also laid with the fact not able to discount non-resident rates. Um, so it can get a bit complicated um, mm. from a tax calculation. That's right. But I mean, you still do get the benefit of the main residence exemption for the previous owner that lived in it. Um, but I guess, you know, that two year mark is pretty important. If you're going to hold on to it, okay, is it just going to be an investment now? Or is it a case where, um, you know, you're going to look to move into it at some point? If you move into it within that two year period, that's great. You know, don't need to worry about cost base resetting or anything like that it can still be covered under that MRE. Um, but after that, that's when tax kicks in and it's a little unfortunate, but it's just the way it goes now. Yeah, it is. And, and you know, we've seen scenarios, some quite big tax bills of people, you know, selling just over the two year mark, you know, and that's the, yeah. that's the, the one that, you know, I was like to say to clients is you don't know what you don't know. So it's important that while you're in that two year window to make smart decisions and to be able to, um, yeah, be uh, open and honest with what you want to do. If you do hold on to it, you know, and you sell it at the five year mark, there's going to be quite a hefty capital gains tax bill. You know, That's if right. you if you if you don't hold on to it, then you know you can sell it CGT free inside that two year window. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what we we always talk about with clients is is that um, our job is to help clients make informed decisions. And mm -hmm. the difference between one year and eleven months and two years and two months could have a dramatic difference in in uh, um, you know, in the result, you know, by, yeah, as I absolutely. say, you know, especially with the growth over the last couple of years, um, you know, we could be talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars of CGT that's accessible now, as opposed to being non-accessible. Yeah, that's right. And then I guess moving on to the other type of property, just a straight up investment property. Um, yep. If it's never been treated as a, a main residence, so there's, there's never a period that you can apply some sort of exemption on it. You're inheriting an investment property that just is continued or is going to be continued rented out. You're inheriting that sort of original cost base as well, um, especially if it's post CGT. Uh, but the fact that you're also a non-resident, there could be a significant amount of capital gain that you'd have to pay tax on. The drawback again is you're paying tax on it at your non-resident tax rates. And, you know, depending on how long you hold it, there's going to be pro rata because you cannot apply that 50% CGT discount concession. That concession was removed back in May, 2012. So it does mean that, if you're receiving inheritance and as part of that inheritance, um, based on your individual life situation, you need to sell it so you can free up capital and move the capital overseas. You know, you, you may be setting up uh, routes uh, in the UK or wherever you might be based. Um, you could be walking away with, you know, one third or, you know, one third depending on the capital gains tax, those sort of things based on the capital gains. So um, it just depends. Um, and I guess what we're really trying to drive home here is that property as an in, as an inheritance, it's highly taxable as a non-resident. Yeah. Um, yep. Non-resident beneficiaries, you just you get taxed through the it's roof. It's the most and toxic asset. It is from an inheritance point of view. When, and again, this is all coming down to the fact that we're discussing about selling these assets. Um, so selling them at the time of, uh, of being a non-resident. So that's where obviously your CGT events kicking in, and you're paying tax. I had a query the other day where they asked about whether. Uh, if they sold a property and because they're a non-resident, um, do they have to pay any tax because they're they're not living here? But yeah, you absolutely do. Yeah, normal yeah. tax applies. More so, more so than Australian Australian residents. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I mean, when they removed that main residence exemption for expats, there was a caveat in there which was target at foreign residents. Uh, so yeah. and non-citizens, where even the tax was even heavier. Uh, essentially, yeah. you couldn't access the partial main residence exemption at all. Um, but, you know, that doesn't usually apply to our clients because they're usually Australian citizens that are living overseas or permanent residents. 
Um, but property as a whole, yeah, probably the most toxic and has the most tax consequences when selling. If you are inheriting a property, main residence exemption, uh, you need to sell it within two years if you want to be tax free. Yep. And let's run on to the next asset class, which is shares. You know, these days shares are a more popular asset that people hold. You know, your aunt or your grandmother or your parents, you know, have a share portfolio as Australian tax residents, you're a non-resident. How does that work on the inheritance side? Yep. So everyone needs to lock into their brains and save CGT event K3. CGT event K3. CGT event K3. So if we are inheriting shares, uh, managed funds, even if the inheritance that you're receiving includes a foreign currency. Um, so you wouldn't you wouldn't think that because you think that's cash. But yeah. a foreign currency, yeah. if you're dealing in a foreign currency as an investment, yes, this will get included as well. But CGT event K3. So because we're a non-residence, uh, we are considered a tax favorable uh, vehicle. Because ordinarily, if you're investing in direct shares as a non-resident or managed funds, you do not accumulate capital gains tax with the ATO because they're treated as non-taxable Australian property. So what happens when CGT event K3 takes place is that technically there is a CGT event that takes place on the date of death, on the day of death return. Uh, and the estate is required to pay tax at the non-resident or, sorry, take a step back, the, the tax is meant to be paid on that day of death tax return because all assets that have been inherited to a non-resident of those shares are technically being sold on paper. It's, uh, I suppose, a deemed disposable De event. Yep. That's right. And normally, if there isn't cash within the estate, a portion of the portfolio is actually sold to foot that tax bill. Yep. Um, but CG event, event K3 happens when a non-resident receives an inheritance of direct shares, managed funds, exchange traded funds, even foreign currency, where tax must be paid based on that deemed disposal event. So it's somewhat frustrating the way that that takes place because, yep, tax is being paid on the day of death tax return. So at more favourable tax rates, they do get the benefit of the 50% CGT discount. They do get the benefit of just your traditional Australian tax resident marginal rates. So that's obviously a little bit better from a tax efficiency point of view. Um, but a lot of the time, this tax is actually forgotten about and it causes more issues for the, uh, I suppose, the beneficiary because CGT event K3 hasn't actually taken place correctly, either by, say, the executor not knowing it needs to be done or the accountant. It means that because these assets that they're holding, the shares, the managed funds, ETS, foreign currency, because they haven't been reset and no deemed disposal has been done, they are now treated as taxable Australian property which yep. means they continue to grow in value over the next five, 10 years. If you don't do anything with them while you're a non-resident, that capital gain is still 100% taxable by the ATO. You can't discount that capital gain. So when you're selling it, you've now got two periods, a period where it was held by obviously the previous owner, the person you inherited it from. Um, and then obviously the period that you've held it where you can't apply the discount. So it gets very messy. It does. And if someone were to inherit shares through a testamentary trust, which is becoming quite popular these days too. How is that different than inheriting shares directly? Well, the CGT event on a test made trust doesn't actually take place for, I suppose, uh, the beneficiaries until it's actually passed over uh, until the individual. So, and this is what should be factoring in. Uh, a testamentary trust as part of an estate plan is something that should be included because it gives the future, I suppose, beneficiaries just options. Um, once it moves into testamentary trust, okay, it's held within that estate until it's actually signed over into that individual's name. That's when the actual tax event will take place. So if that happens when you're back in Australia, ordinary Australian tax present, it's going to be treated a lot more favourable. You don't actually need to worry about this CGT event K3. So a testamentary trust just gives you flexibility and future options and that means that you don't physically have to obviously move it over to that individual's name. But I'll admit not every will or most wills probably won't include a testamentary trust because they haven't sought advice. They've just gone, okay, it's going to move over to this individual's name and that's it. No no accounting for the tax ramifications. You could argue that a testamentary trust is more suitable for Australian residents than it is for non-residents. You know, if you are a non-resident with no plans of returning back to Australia anytime shortly, then you're better off getting the estate to take the tax hit early. Yeah. And then from then on, you're not accruing a liability. If you right. keep holding those assets in a testamentary trust, let's say for the next five years, and mm -hmm. then decide to dispose of it, 
then you virtually had that five years when if you'd done the tax, mm. it's five years capital gains tax free, if it's in a testamentary yeah. trust, that's a liability that's still accruing in the background. That's right. I mean, I suppose good estate planning lawyers who know that there are non-resident beneficiaries in there, when they're creating the estate plan and the will, they'll sometimes grant the executor, I guess you could call them special powers um, within the will, to uh, it essentially gives them the ability to wind down specific assets based on the potential tax ramifications of those beneficiaries. I think it's um, giving them the right or the power of appropriation depending on the beneficiaries. So that's pretty important, but it's not sort of something that's just templated into all wills. You really need to speak to someone that is a bit of a specialist Knowledgeable. because they'll then yeah. account for that. That's right. I mean, I'll admit non-resident beneficiaries, not a very common thing. Um, no. So uh, it's for us, using- but not for everyone else. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. So when you're using a testament and trust, yep, can be quite handy, but it also comes down to the type of asset. Remember, property taxed very differently to shares. Um, yeah. You know, property, when you inherit it, will CGT event doesn't actually come around until you actually sell it. Shares, will CGT event K3 can come around straight away and then you're up for the tax and you usually have to sell some of the shares down to pay the tax. Very different how it's treated. It is. It is. And I think that's, you know, why people get so confused. And to me, why a lot of people struggle with what to do and they sort of do nothing um, because it's easy to do nothing and just tell yourself you'll work it out later. Um, mm. But as we can see in both, if you inherit a property and go past the two years or inherit shares for testaments you trust and gave for a number of years, um, mm. it could be quite an expensive exercise. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's probably other asset classes that we're not probably talking about too much and, you know, superannuation, I guess you could treat it as a separate asset class, but it depends on sort of the life stage that you're receiving uh, or inheriting someone's super. If it's a case where you're receiving a reversionary pension and you're the spouse, then, you know, you'll just keep receiving the pension the monthly amount. Um, if it's a case where you're inheriting a pension um, and you're considered a, um, a dependent beneficiary, um, then there's obviously going to be tax consequences on the super fund as part of it paying out because there's going to be different components. There's going to be taxable components, going to be untaxed components, going to be tax-free component. Very complicated calculation that the accounts usually have to do when they pay out super um, upon death of someone. It's, um, it's not a sort of one-size-fits-all. But superannuation is agnostic regardless of whether you're a tax resident or a non-resident. So that's one, I suppose, certainty. Uh, And then other things that we don't often talk about because we don't really appreciate them, uh, especially the the types overseas, the bonds and those sort of things. Um, They're they're pretty complicated. I know in Australia, we've got a different type of bond, that sort of 10-year bond. At the end of the 10 years, it's it's tax-free and they can be used as good little... uh, inheritance vehicles or um, good way to sort of pass over wealth because after 10 years it's just tax-free but you really are confined to what the investment options are within the bonds which is usually only a, a laundry list you know 10 to 15 which is the concern yep it is and i think that's a it's a great point because to me people's financial affairs now are becoming more complicated than they were say 20 years ago let alone 10 years ago and certainly you know even before then i think the biggest thing is you know people do sort of uh, they have good intent, so they'll talk to a relative, uh, they'll talk to a friend, you know, who may be gone through something like this, but that relative or friend may not be a non-resident. And we come mm. across this a lot of people getting information. Yep. Yeah, yeah. They, 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 they say, oh, I've got this, what should I do with it? And they say, well, in my case, I did this, and I sort of advice, and, and people take that on board and go, okay, I'm going to do that as well, not realising that their situation is completely opposite. You know, like I've said in previous episodes, when you become an expat, when you become a non-resident, you need to take the Akuba off because you are treated no differently than a Chinese or a Russian or a British investor. And, yeah. you know, that's an important point to make is those key considerations are the ones that um, will make a massive difference. You know, mm. people these days uh, are trying to develop their financial affairs in a very cost-effective and sort of smart way. Um, you can have the lowest cost options everywhere. But if you're paying a couple hundred thousand dollars in tax uh, unnecessarily, then it's all for naught. Yeah, that's right. And I agree. I feel like every couple of years, yeah, obviously financial affairs, financial situations, they're all becoming more complex. It's also just due to the fact that you've got more investment instruments or financial products. You know, you've got cryptocurrency yeah. now. You know, it's treated the same as 
a foreign currency or like you're investing in share, capital gains, currency gain, all those sort of considerations. I'm sure in the next few years, uh, they'll start talking about these non-fungible tokens, which is like a cryptocurrency or this digital asset. Yep. It's just going to keep yep. going on and going on. So it is going to keep just getting more and more complex. Um, so that's why you do need to consider planning appropriately, uh, just so when you are moving your wealth onto the next generation of your family, it's done in the most tax efficient manner. Non-residents, I think they have an extra layer as always to deal with because they might have to deal with the local rules. Um, mm. You know, I suppose these international wills that you, you hear of, I, I'm not sure how effective they can be. Look, I think the the estate planning side is becoming more interlaced, which is good. Yep. You know, I know, I know yep. here in the UAE, there was a big announcement late last year that said if you're an Australian in the UAE and you have an Australian will, then the Dubai courts will act on an Australian will, which is fantastic. So they're not going to put you through the regulations from a Sharia law point of view. Um, other countries, they're in a similar situation as well too. You know, and to me, I guess the rule of thumb that I've always said to my clients, you have a will in the countries that you have assets in. Yes. And yes by doing exactly. that, that really sort things out. And you can do other things as well too that makes life a bit easier, certainly from the executive's point of view and, and beneficiary's point of view. Joint accounts, you know, husband and wife, if something happens to the husband or the wife, the other person automatically gets that asset by way of survivorship. You know, so just little things structured well can make what is a very, very difficult time emotionally uh, a bit easier to deal with. You know, it's these little yeah. considerations in advance. And also to talk to your parents. You know, if, if you don't have any plans to return to Australia in, in the short, medium term, uh, and they do talk at these sort of things, you know, they may be taking advice from a solicitor or an accountant in Australia as they're in Australia and all the considerations are Australian resident considerations not knowing or not understanding that you are a non-resident and that your circumstances are very different. So, I mean, the good thing is in America, they don't have inheritance tax from stuff that's in Australia, which is great, but there's other complications facts on the, on the, on the IRS side as well, in terms of what you do with that money. So, you know, if you inherited ETFs, then suddenly that's a PFIC. Um, you know, yeah. there's all that sort of, it, it is a rabbit hole that you jump down a thousand times over. So um, yeah, look, I, I think, you know, we've given people enough, considerations thoughts and feedback anyway on on managing inheritance um mm. so i don't think we we go into too much more detail on this because it can you know we could go on for another hour or so um, well it is it is a labyrinth <laughs> it is it is but i think yeah we've hit the key the key points there so i think we'll mm. we'll wrap it up there um yep. a couple more reviews on the uh, on the podcast so thank you very much guys we really appreciate it also to we're seeing a lot of folks jumping across onto Jeremy and James's, I said it right this time, um, podcast, the Expat Mortgage Podcast. So if you want to learn more about managing and getting a mortgage as an expat, just Google Expat Mortgage Podcast. We're on Apple and yep. Spotify. Um, also, to a lot of this, a lot of these web uh, episodes and, and uh, this information is actually on our website too. So if you go to atlaswealth.com, under resources, you'll see a section there. Um, sorry, news, I think it is. Um, uh, news and media there's a there's a podcast page you'll see all of our episodes yeah. from both both podcast channels if you need to go back and look at something um by all means you know jump on there and most important of all if you have questions send them through you know if you're watching That's this right. on youtube put them in the comments below if you're um you know listening to this on the podcast just drop us an email at info at atlaswealth.com not very hard to remember um no. say hey love you to co cover this topic because we're certainly audience driven when it comes to this information uh, that that's we're right. talking about. So we want to make sure that you guys are listening to things that you need to know, uh, not listening to us waffle on. <laughs> no, I think we do a good job. I, I, we already know that most of the content that we're talking about, it's, yeah, it's either inquiry or client driven. Inherence yeah. just to be a major topic and it has been probably for the last couple of months. So, And it will be for the next couple of years as we see this transition of wealth from baby boomers to the younger generations. Uh, it's right. only going to get bigger, which is one of the reasons why we want to jump on this call to, to let everyone know. Yeah, sounds good. All right, Brett, well, thanks for your time today. Mate, good to see you again, and we'll see you on the next episode. See you, mate. Cheers. Thanks, mate.